Hello, welcome to the Lambeth Country Show and thanks for coming to have a look at my talk. This is a talk about an allotment year. Uh, my name is Alan Williams. Apologies if you've watched one of my other talks and have heard this already, but I'm going to quickly introduce myself. Uh, this is me at three years old with a, a runner bean plant and uh, it's one of my earliest recollections of when I started gardening. As a kid, we were lucky enough to live with my parents in a reasonable sized uh, house and garden. And when I was growing up, I had a small veggie patch in that garden in one corner. And I'd grow things like carrots and runner beans and lettuces and a few other simple things. Um, I think I took a lot of my inspiration uh, as in becoming a gardener from my uh, my dad on the left there and also my maternal grandfather who are both kind of great gardeners and and lovers of the countryside in in general now i'm a environmental consultant most of the time um, but i also come out and talk about allotments and growing vegetables in particular uh, normally in person but obviously uh, in these uh, strange times, uh, a little bit more online and in a, in a virtual space. And as a result, I'd normally um, ask, you know, if this was live, where where are you from? What do you, you know, where do you garden and, and get some feedback from you as an audience? But obviously, I can't do that today. Um, so if you've come to listen to this talk based on the, uh, the title, and you're already an allotment holder, I apologise if uh, I'm going to teach you to suck eggs a bit, um, but I hope you enjoy the talk just the same. Um, and obviously, uh, if you've got any questions um, or any feedback, do come back to me. There's a slide at the end with uh, contact details on. Thank you. So what do I mean by an allotment year? Um, my year is never really January to December. It's never really a calendar year. Um, I think of it more in the in these terms as uh, different times when I'm planning and preparing what um, I'm going to be growing and then sowing and planting that and then looking after it, the nurturing and maintaining the watering, the weeding, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then obviously harvesting and in theory relaxing. But I think you might get the impression as you listen to this talk that I don't do that much relaxing, although actually I think I probably do more than I should. Um, yes, I do follow the calendar. There's obviously certain things that you can only do at certain times of the year, uh, but broadly speaking, uh, this is kind of the cycle that I'm talking about. So where do I start my planning? Well, it's very much in a, in a pocket notebook. Um, I've drawn a quick sketch and trying to divide up the plot where I think things are going to go. Obviously, there's things like the shed and the fruit beds and compost bins that don't change much over the course of the years. Um, but then the other bits, the, the main areas of the allotment where all the veg is growing, that does change. Um, I translate that normally into something a bit more uh, technologically advanced. It's a bit of a spreadsheet. And as you can see, the nice start kind of putting in the, where things are going to be. And um, because I rotate my plot year to year, so I generally follow a, a three uh, system rotation. So roots, things like uh, potatoes and things like that. And then the legumes, the peas and the beans, and then the brassicas, so the cauliflower, the cabbage, the sprouts, those sorts of things. And other things like uh, alliums, the onions and salad crops go in in between those. So I uh, will have a look at this and look back at last year's and say, well, OK, my potatoes were there last year. That means probably my broad beans need to go there when I finished with the potatoes and, and so on. Of course, having a plan is a, is a great thing until it all goes to pot and normally it goes to pot because of the weather. So these two halves of this slide here, you can see um, on the right, this was 2017. It's the end of March. Um, and then a year later on exactly the same day, this is what the plot looked like. So if you can see the, the compost bin there, 
as kind of a marker to give you an idea of, of where things are. But um, I normally put my uh, potatoes in the ground towards the end of March. And that's exactly what I did in 2017. In 2018, they didn't go in much more until the middle of April because we'd had snow, the ground was frozen, it was too cold for the potatoes to go in, so they had to wait. Um, so there's no guarantees in gardening. And as I say, weather is often one of the things that will disrupt the best laid plans. I always try and grow something new each year, uh, just as a bit of an experiment, just to see uh, how it grows. This year I'm trying fennel for the first time. I haven't grown fennel on the allotment before. Um, having a bit of mixed success, the slugs seem to like it, or the snails seem to like it quite a lot. So we're losing plants uh, a little bit faster than I would like, um, but I'm hoping we'll get a couple of nice bulbs of fennel. Uh, but in the past, I've grown things like patty pan squash instead of courgettes, just as a change. And I still grow these to this day, um, purely because they got, they're quite nice and sweet and they've got a nice nutty flavour. They're a bit more uh, flavoursome than perhaps your average, ordinary, bog standard courgette. Um, this is horseradish root. I um, wanted to grow some horseradish so that I could produce my own uh, horseradish sauce for Sunday lunch and uh, it was yeah I managed it um, I won't be doing it again because it was just too fiery hot um, you don't need much horseradish for uh, a horseradish sauce as I discovered um, and then these little pumpkins this was an effort to try and um, grow smaller pumpkins um, because if you can imagine a, a sort of jack-o-lantern sized pumpkin is is something that uh, if you're growing it to eat uh, it's a bit like uh, having something that becomes the the staple of your diet for about a fortnight so i tried to grow something a little bit smaller different variety a bit smaller um, this is a standard sort of enamel mug it's not a, a huge great big mug um, so you can see that these little pumpkins didn't turn out quite the way I intended. They were a bit too on the small side, so uh, we won't be growing them again. One of the other things I like to get done early when I'm uh, planning the, the plot and where things are going to go is if I'm growing runner beans or French climbing beans or something like that, um, I always like to dig a bean trench. Now, garden law says that you sow your runner beans uh, in pots on the first bank holiday in May, and then you plant them out in the garden or the allotment on the second bank holiday. And I think as a rule of thumb, that holds up pretty well. Um, but what I like to do uh, before that, sort of back in uh, February or March, is to dig a bean trench. This is literally dig a trench. Um, and then what I do is, is fill it with um, some cardboard or newspaper or you know that packing cardboard packing paper that you get uh, when you buy something online and it comes in a huge great big box and it's like a toothbrush or something like that it comes in a huge box with loads of that packing paper in that's ideal so don't throw it away uh, save it and use it for your bean trench so I put that in the bottom of the trench then uh, top that off with some manure um, and then simply backfill the trench and mark where the four corners are so that you uh, know where to put your bean canes when they need to go up. Now, why do I do all of that? What's the point? Well, two reasons. One, um, it helps retain moisture. So when you're watering your beans, the uh, cardboard and the manure is, is, is retaining water. So it's uh, helping to, um, helping you to water less basically so you're watering you're watering the plants the excess is being stored in that in that reservoir of cardboard and manure um, and then you're not having to water quite so much um, and then secondly it provides some nutrition so that layer of manure provides additional nutrition for the plants now beans being legumes uh, provide quite a bit of nitrogen themselves but obviously they still need nutrients to grow so uh, dig a bean trench and and then when you come to plant out your beans say so you'll be watering less and hopefully you'll get better beans because um, you know you've got that additional uh, nutrition there for the plants 
I'm also sowing and planting all year round. I'm lucky enough to live far enough on the south coast where we have quite mild winters. We still get snow, obviously, as you've seen, but um, it means that I can get away with growing things uh, and overwintering them. So leeks and broad beans and garlics and onions, things like that I can sow quite late in the year, as, you know, as late as November, and then harvesting them a little bit earlier in May or June. Um, some things like the garlic, they need the cold anyway. So you will always plant the garlic out so that it gets the cold temperatures of winter. Um, the, the cold helps the cloves set in the bulb. So you get cloves of garlic rather than just one big bulb. Um, and, you know, it means that I get some of my crops a little bit earlier um, in the year. But I'm also saying things like things like chilies and peppers need a long summer heat and if you can sow them early enough so you know sowing them on the you know the first of January and having those uh, seedlings on a windowsill somewhere is great you know they they will thrive in that heat and then you'll get a much better chance of getting um, chilies and, and peppers in the summer because they get the full length of the of the warm period um, I've done that this year with cucumbers and I have to say at the moment we are absolutely inundated with uh, cucumbers which is great because I love cucumbers but uh, I know they're not to everyone's uh, cup of tea and at the same time I'm preparing um, my potatoes so I, I prefer to plant my potatoes in trenches and then earth up those trenches uh, I know other people prefer using bags or pots and it, I think it's a matter of personal choice, to be honest. It's whatever works for you and where if you've got space, you know, you don't need an allotment to grow potatoes. You can grow them in a bag on your backyard quite, quite easily. Um, but before I plant my potatoes, I'm chitting them several weeks before. So I normally get my potatoes kind of early January time. And then I just uh, leave the get some old egg boxes um, and just leave them in the egg boxes um, in the daylight and they will start to sprout so you'll get nice purple sprouts you don't want to put them in the dark you need them in the light um, and when you've got some nice purple sprouts um, and you're past they've got a kind of risk of frost time so for me that's as I say end of March early April um, put them in dig a trench put them in earth them up um, and then depending on the variety, about you know, three months later, you're going to be uh, digging them up and you'll have lots of nice potatoes to, to eat. As I say, different varieties at different times of the year. But, you know, um, mine generally, uh, we've just literally started harvesting uh, in the last week and we're getting lots of nice new potatoes. Um, Mid spring, I'm sowing sweet corn courgettes, pumpkins, all of these indoors um, and then to plant out a bit later when things have really warmed up, when we're getting overnight temperatures that are just about staying in double figures, so kind of 9, 10, 11 degrees of Celsius overnight, um, any cooler than that um, you need to provide some kind of cover I think for them at night, so a bit of fleece or something like that. Um, overwintering onions I've talked about, I do a second sowing of onions in the spring so kind of early April time and uh, it means I get a second crop but they come later in the year so I'm I've harvested my overwintering onions uh, in fact I harvested them last weekend um, and I will now be uh, harvesting the next lot in about six to eight weeks time uh, so more towards sort of August, end of August, um, and they'll last us for the rest of the year stored properly. Um, if I've got any left over, what I do is, is just plant them in modules um, and keep them either out on the plot in the modules. And then just as space arises, put a row in and transplant them out. And um, as I say, you know, early August onwards, we'll be getting uh, the second crop of, of onions. Now that nurturing and maintaining I mentioned, that's uh, really kind of critical. Unfortunately, a lot of it is to do with weeding and you know, stopping slugs and snails and things like that uh, 
from from eating your crops before you do. Um, now one of the things that I grow on on my plot is comfrey. Um, it's not something that you can eat, but it is something that you can use to make a liquid fertilizer. So comfrey is is a vigorous growing plant. You really don't want to let it get out of control. Uh, you want to keep it fairly constrained. But what you do, uh, you you let it grow, let it flower because it has the amazing flowers, which the bees and the other pollinators absolutely love. So you let it flower, don't let it go to seed. As soon as it's finished flowering, cut it off at ground level, and I do mean ground level. You can hack it right back. You won't you won't kill it. Um, and then strip the leaves off of the stems and put them in a in a bucket, preferably a bucket with a lid. And I'll tell you why that's important in a sec. The rest of the plant can go on the compost heap uh, and it will break down and it, it has a similar effect to um, what you're doing with the leaves, but it's, it's a slower process. Um, then once you've got all the leaves in the bucket, you want to uh, cover those with uh, water, just ordinary water from the water butt. Um, and just weigh them down with a, a brick or a stone, just so that the leaves stay below the surface of the water. Then put the lid on and then put something on top of the lid to keep the lid on. The reason this is necessary is because what you're doing is creating a liquid fertilizer, but it is the most noxious smelling liquid fertilizer you can imagine. So what you need to do is make sure that lid is tightly on because you do not want to be around well this is uh, rotting away which is exactly what it's doing um, about two three weeks later uh, you can take the lid off and this is this is probably the worst bit because it really does smell um, and you want to just decant the liquid that's there into um, a bottles or, or whatever you've got again something with a lid so just decant the liquid, be careful not to spill it on your clothes uh, because you will go around smelling like the compost heap. Um, and then, as I say, keep that to one side. The, the, there's a be a gunk in the bottom. Um, I always say stick that on your neighbor's compost heap because it, it's also very foul smelling, but no, that can go on your compost heap as well. Um, and then the liquid fertilizer that you've created you can then use that uh, and dilute it again so you don't need very much um, a few milliliters in a in a in a five liter uh, watering can is plenty but you can use that to water and fertilize uh, your plants your veg um, and you can use it as a foliar feed or a root feed uh, whichever you choose um, and it works really really well the other thing you can do uh, if you've got a lot of comfrey and you don't want to make bucket loads of, of liquid fertilizer is just lay this down um, it works pretty well if you're growing potatoes you can lay it down on the ridges where you're growing the potatoes um, it keeps the weeds down suppresses weeds because it's obviously covering the surface of the soil and again it's also doing things like water retention and things like that so it's it's multi-purpose but it's a great plant and you don't need very much of it to um, have you know fertilizer for the, for the rest of the season now i mentioned um slugs and snails and i'm not going to really talk about slugs and snails because you know beer traps for slugs is probably the best thing that can happen to them um, but there are a few other bugs and beasties that i'm just going to mention because you might not be aware about of them and you might be wondering these are pea plants for example and you see these notches around the edges of the leaves now this happens you know if you've got an infestation of a particular insect and this is he this is a, a magnified view so they're not really this big uh, this is the pea and bean weevil uh citona linaceus i think is its uh, latin name and basically it will it will come along and uh, it will chomp the edges of the leaves I presume because the edges are sweet tasting. It doesn't ravish the whole leaf like a slug would. It just does it, and it does it on raw beans, peas, um, anything like that. You can stop it doing that by covering the plants uh, with a fleece or a, uh, something like EnviroMesh, um, or you can sow 
over winter. So I had a lot of my broad beans I sow uh, in late, uh, mid to late November. And uh, I'm pretty much, they only uh, attack the young plants. So by the time the adults are around, so these adult uh, weevils, they don't appear till April or July. Um, and by then I've got quite tall broad beans and they won't touch them. So uh, it's not a problem. If you do notice that you're getting uh, notching on your leaves, what you can do is just put a, a tray of water under the plants and just give the plants a shake. And the, the weevils aren't particularly adept at hanging on, so they'll fall off into the water uh, and then you can dispose of them. There are other chemicals that uh, I, I tend to grow organically, so I don't really, you know, talk about the chemicals too much but if you're um if you're a smoker and you smoke uh cigarettes with a filter tip then save the filter tips uh, the butts um, and then you can uh, mix them up in in water and then use that mixed water in a spray bottle and spray the plants um they don't like the nicotine in the uh in the butts and, and hence in the uh, spray so it tends to dissuade them. The other thing you might see uh, is, particularly on peas, is a silvery mottling um, and this is caused by something called the pea thrip um, and again uh, it's not a great fan of, of trying to hang on so you can dislodge them fairly easily um, but again early planting is a good strategy so the earlier you can plant the better because the, the thrips are really not active sort of until like June through to August so um, if you sow early and get your peas early then you won't have problems like with the silver mottling. Uh, this is a good guy this is a violet ground beetle you don't generally see them during the day because they're a nocturnal predator but they will eat any small invertebrates or any other small insect uh, or slugs uh, they also attack things like vine weevils so they are if you've got these they are fantastic to have uh, in your garden or on your allotment because they will eat all the nasty bugs um, and they won't attack your plants um, you're probably familiar if you're a gardener with uh, the cabbage white butterfly uh, there's a large white and a small white um, same genus different species um, again the butterfly isn't too is is not the major problem it's the caterpillar of the butterfly that's the problem obviously the, the butterfly lays her eggs on um, whatever brassica you've got growing whether it's cabbages or cauliflowers or sprouts um, the best way to stop them is just to net your brassica bed um, net any sort of netting that is as got a narrow enough mesh to stop the butterfly getting in or to stop her getting um, the, the back end of her abdomen through. So where she uh, oviposits her eggs, she does that through the back end of her abdomen. So if you've got the kind of uh, mesh that's big enough to stop her flying through, um, but if you, if you put it too close to your brassicas, she will stick her back end through and lay her eggs just the same. So I find this really fine mesh is kind of the best on the left there is the best to use. Um, very often you can find it uh, in skips on building sites. Uh, so if you ask the, the builder if he's getting rid of the mesh that's been up around the scaffolding, if you can have it, uh, that works really well. Um, this other mesh that I very often put over uh, fruit beds will keep uh, birds off the fruit. Um, but it's the sort of thing that um, certainly the small white can can squeeze through um, but also as I say they can stick their back end through and do uh, the egg laying that way. Of course you don't have to be fancy you can just use your old neck curtains or your mum's old neck curtains if uh, she's got them. Probably best to ask if you can have them before you take them out of the windows but um, that works just as well um, and in particular uh, it works uh, later in the in the year when the, the uh, butterflies aren't around. So if you're sowing quite late, um, you can probably get away with um, something that isn't quite uh, 
de rigueur for the gardener. Um, the other thing you might see uh, in your on your plot uh, are these caterpillars. Uh, they look quite ferocious and they will act quite ferociously. They use, very much use these eyes on their on their heads as a as a deterrent, mostly to being eaten by themselves. But um, this is an elephant hawk moth caterpillar. And now, again, it will eat, uh, basically it will eat weeds. So willow herb and things like that. Um, if you're a, a flower gardener, it will also eat your fuchsias and bed straws and things like that as well. Um, so, you know, uh, horses for courses, good to have on the allotment because it will eat a lot of the weeds. Um, not so good if you grow flowers. Um, and this is what it uh, turns into. This is the uh, elephant hawk moth itself um, and this loves tubular plants so it's uh, things like honeysuckle things that have got a long tube flower it loves those um, a few years ago um, there was very much an, uh, a message in the news to keep a lookout for a certain type of ladybird now we have a, a native British ladybird you're probably aware but uh, you may not be aware of, of this, which is the harlequin ladybird. Now these are all harlequin ladybirds. Uh, and then on the bottom left there, that's uh, a, 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 a um, larvae. So that's a, a butterfly larvae, uh, sorry, a ladybird larvae. Uh, so that's what you get before you get ladybirds. Um, and it will pupate into a ladybird. Now these are just as good for eating aphids and black fly and all the sorts of things that ladybirds uh, are good for in the garden. Unfortunately, they are also great at outcompeting the native British ladybirds. Um, and I think to the point where these are pretty much endemic now. Um, so if you see a British ladybird, it's, it's very much something to celebrate because they're uh, much more in the, in the rare category than they once were. Now, while you're doing that uh, nurturing and maintaining bit, uh, if you get black fly on your broad beans, um, and those are all sorts of ways we're told to deal with it from spraying with soapy water to obviously chemical uh, methods. The easiest and simplest way to stop black fly on your broad bean is to stop them getting there in the first place. And the way to do that is as the broad beans are growing, just wait until they've reached the point where they've got all the flowers that they need, you, you think they need, and then just pinch the tops out. So go along each plant and pinch the tops out. It will stop um, the broad bean growing, and you don't really need it to keep growing tall if you've got the flowers, because the flowers are what uh, are gonna be pollinated and produce the, the pods with the beans in. So pinch the tops out. The energy will go into the plant yeah, to the plant in in forming pods and beans but the reason you get black flies because they love the tops because they are really sweet and you can eat them uh, you can take them home and uh, if you if you want something decadent uh, some tempura batter uh, around your broad bean tops is is gorgeous um, but yeah that will stop you getting black fly on your broad beans We've got a particular problem on our plot with a mammal, species of, of mammal that loves sweet corn. It um, will absolutely devastate a plot of sweet corn. It all seems to know when the sweet corn is at its ripest and it comes along and it pushes the plants over and it strips the corn off the cob and just leaves the devastation for you to find the next day. The only way to deal with it is to put up a, a kind of chicken wire enclosure with netting over the top and quite stout boards around the bottom to stop it digging underneath. Um, it's quite a performance. Um, this is a badger and it's badgers that are doing this. We've got a, an old railway line that runs behind our plots and they've got a set up in the, up in the, under the, in the railway bank and they just come down. Wait, they, they know when the sweet corn's ripe and they come in and, and they have a whale of a time. Not a lot we can do about it. Um, I tend to, mm, 
Uh, last year I didn't bother with sweet corn. I've got some this year because a neighbor gave me some plants, but I wasn't going to bother. Um, so I'll see what happens this year. Um, I don't mind them having it, to be honest. Uh, they get enough hassle from from us in in other respects. So, uh, you know, score one for the badgers and zero for the humans. Uh, you may see these on your plot. Uh, this is a, a slow worm. And uh, it's not a worm. It's also not a snake. It's a legless lizard. But it also loves uh, slugs and worms. Um, so great if you've got a slug problem, uh, have lots of slow worms, uh, will help you out. If you have got a slug problem, uh, you could try the nematode slug treatment. On an allotment, it's a very expensive method of, of treating slugs. I go for beer and salt traps. I find that they work much better. Um, but as I say, you can do it. Um, but, you know, when you're looking to control bad insects, you can't beat the great British robin. Um, and if you've got problems with uh, small mammals like rabbits, uh, mice and voles, then we've got a quite healthy fox population. So uh, they keep that well under control for us. So what happens when you get to the point where you're harvesting? You know, you've grown all of that wonderful food. Um, we're, we're already getting, as I say, things like cucumbers, but also soft fruit. We've got loads of gooseberries. Those of um, loganberries, which are um, a hybrid between a blackberry and a raspberry. Uh, red currants and black currants are just coming along. Um, we've had loads of broad beans and we've had loads of radishes. Um, it's been a really good year so far. Um, I'm hoping we're going to get uh, a good harvest of squash and pumpkins and things like that later on. So more towards uh, October time. Uh, kale and sprouts for the winter. Um, we'll, we'll be uh, pickling and making jam and chutneys and things like that, I'm sure. Um, it's one of the times of the year where you're not only harvesting, but you're wondering what to do with all that produce and you can't give away courgettes. People don't want them. They, you know, they, they cross the street to avoid you if they see you coming because you think they think you're going to give them a courgette. Um, of course, you can make ratatouille. Um, and, you know, if you've got some aubergines and, and some of those peppers are ready, you know, make a nice ratatouille. I always like to make things that you can store. So ratatouille freezes really well. So it's one of those things that, you know, if you're harvesting stuff and you haven't got, uh, physically haven't got the capacity to eat it, then uh, by all means, turn it into jams or chutneys or, or, or pies or whatever it is. And, you know, invest in a big freezer and uh, store it in the freezer. Uh, blackberries will come and blackberry and apple crumble. Um, all those sorts of things, uh, tarts. Uh, turnovers, all the sorts of things you can do through ice cream. Uh, we invested in an ice cream maker, very simple, cheap ice cream maker. Um, and we make fantastic gooseberry ice cream and blackcurrant ice cream, all sorts of things you kind of wouldn't associate with being in an ice cream. Anyway, that's my talk for uh, an allotment year. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, I appreciate you can't ask them now, but uh, I'm at Tonto Williams um, on both Twitter and uh, Instagram. So do reach out if you're on the same platforms. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And thanks for listening to me. Take care now. Bye bye.